don't all of us sometimes have a doubt? Don't we all doubt? And yet, how often do we talk about those doubts, those fears, those questions? Sometimes we hide those doubts behind masks of pretense. Oh no, I, 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 never, I never question. I wouldn't want to be like Thomas. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have sunk like Peter. But don't we all have doubts? He was named one of the strongest disciples, and he truly was. He was a twin. There were two of them. He was a soldier. And days before, Jesus says, we're going up to Jerusalem, and I'm going there to die. And Thomas says, and I'm going there with you, and I'll die right beside you. It's not just a hot air. He's serious about it. The other disciples, will, including Peter, will try to talk Jesus out of it. I'm not going to let you go. And Jesus tells Peter, get behind me, Satan. But Thomas is convinced this man is worth dying for, and we're going to Jerusalem, and we're going to die, and so be it. He's a soldier ready for battle. He's going on to the battlefield. He knows that he very well may be requested to give up his life, and he is heading out regardless. He sees it as an honor and a privilege. He is not a coward. And maybe we have taken and put a label on a man that is inappropriate. We've taken one moment that we need to be more than thankful for. Because Thomas does for us what you and I would, frankly, have wanted to do if we had been there. Thomas takes things very seriously. And while the others might be going a little bit crazy, he says, look, you all say you've seen him. <laughs> That's wonderful. I don't know but I'm not going to believe it unless I can put my fingers there where those nails went in, unless I can feel that spot where the sword went in his side. The movie's built on that kind of a same storyline, if you will. This Roman soldier is trying to find out if where Jesus' body is. And he's going to come to a place where he's actually going to see Jesus. And then he's going to have to decide, do I believe or not? Do I believe or not? And like Thomas, Jesus will say to him, it will be better for those, it's more amazing even for those who have not seen and yet believe. Thomas, look, you've seen You've touched. You've felt. Now, stop disbelieving. <laughs> There's an incredible story, and we're going to look at it this morning. It's in Mark, the ninth chapter, verse 17 and following. The context of the story is Jesus is up on a mountain. He's on a mountain with just a couple of his disciples, and God is doing something very special for his son. It's just days before Jesus is going to go to Jerusalem and be crucified. And so God has prepared this moment for Elijah and Moses, as prophecy even told, for Elijah and Moses to come and minister to Jesus. They're up on this mountain. And... And they appear to Jesus. And they're talking with him. Peter gets so excited about the moment that he says, Jesus, Jesus, we need to build a couple, ta three tabernacles, one for each one of you, and put them up here and celebrate the fact that, that this has just taken place. And God says, Peter, and, and literally, be quiet. <laughs> be quiet. This is my son. Listen to him. It's one of those moments that we really shouldn't interrupt. Father, 
has brought two faithful servants to meet with Jesus, to help strengthen him, to help encourage him, to help him go into this battle that he's about to face. Have you ever been on a gurney ready to go into the operating room? And you're preparing to go into that operating room and you're just a little bit nervous or maybe even downright scared. And perhaps it's that serious that you've been told we don't know if you're going to last through this or not. <laughs> I still remember the day that the doctor said, okay, we're going to do bypass surgery on you, Bill. And I'm like, oh, wonderful. Get to have the chest split wide open. This was, now they've changed this. It's a little bit nicer. <laughs> that was not what was going to happen to me. Saw right down here with, with uh, Virgil's uh, skill saw, okay? Take Daryl's pliers and pry you open. I'm like, this is not looking fun at all. And just before you go in, have you ever had somebody stop then, grab your hand, and pray with you? Have you felt that supernatural touch as you're getting ready to go into this severe moment? Have you felt the supernatural touch of God? I have to say that when I had my heart experience, there was something special about it. I could feel the power of God, the presence of God, the touch of God. It was special. Now, I don't recommend that you go do that to get the experience. And fortunately, I didn't have to have the saw, but that's a whole other story. But the, here's the thing. God's touch is unique. And what God is doing for Jesus is sacred and holy as he's preparing him. Do you remember what Jesus cries out when he's hanging on the cross? My God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? Do you remember what Jesus does the night before he goes to the cross? All right, God, we're ready to do this, man. Let's go in there and fight them off. Let's beat them up. Let's tear them apart. Yay, man. Right? It's not kind of how the way the word says it. He's anguishing. Sweat drops as of blood, literally. In fact, the... Uh, um, Doctors will tell you that when your blood pressure is so high, there's some things that can happen. Capillaries start to break, and you can actually literally have blood coming out of your, where your sweat would come out. It's amazing. Here's Jesus, sweating like blood. I'm thinking he's a bit stressed. But God gave him this moment with, with Elijah and Moses to help him to get ready comes down the mountain. Okay, I think if you had had a moment like that, you're just a little bit on a high. Just, just a little bit on a high. He comes down the mountain. Okay, we're heading to Jerusalem. And he gets down the mountain, and he's, here, here's an argument going on. A bunch of people, the religious leaders, are arguing with the disciples. What is going on? Oh, man, you guys, you unbelieving people. What is this? The man comes up to him. Well, let's look at the story. Ma Mark 9, verse 17. Jesus just come down the mountain. You unbelieving generation, what's going on? And a man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the Spirit, but they could not. You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. When the Spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. <laughs> if you can... <clears throat> 
said Jesus. Everything is possible for one who believes. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And the spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently, and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. Don't we all have doubts? See, friend, circumstances can influence our belief. Here's a little boy possessed by a spirit. The spirit is causing him some great problems. Uh, He's, it's throwing him to the ground at times and they had fires in their homes where they cook and on so there'd be times they'd throw him into, like, into the fire. Uh, he, they, he would throw him into the water, the spirit would, and try to drown him. He, he may actually uh, also have something like epileptic type seizures. He's foaming at the mouth, gnashing his teeth. His body's become very rigid like somebody with a seizure and, and he's suffering. Okay, please don't make uh, any, anything from this, but today we would call things like that stuff like autism and epilepsy, wouldn't we? Now, I am, I, let me be really clear. I am not saying that somebody who is autistic has a demon. Okay, just hear me clearly on that. I'm also not saying that somebody who's epileptic has a demon. Please hear me clearly, okay? But to help us understand what this father was going through, the best example, the best comparison would be look at a family who's facing a child with autism. And they're unable to talk. And then they're unable to communicate. And that's this little boy. Look at a family that's got a child with epilepsy or, uh, and a person who's just going into seizures. And the body becomes rigid and they literally lose control and almost a sense of not being conscious. And, and, and if something like that happens and you went into an epileptic seizure and there was a fire right there, you'd be vulnerable to falling in that fire and burning and hurting yourself very seriously. And so it just helps us to understand a little bit what this dad's been going through. And he's heard that this Messiah healer guy, Jesus from Nazareth, is there and he's been healing all kinds of other people. And you've brought your son. And, you know, frankly, you don't mind going to the disciples because you've heard they've been healing too. So you go to the disciples and say, please just cast the demon out. I understand that's what you guys do, so please. And he comes, and they're unable to do it. Now, now he's distraught. And in addition to that, now you've got worse than Job's friends having a conversation. No, the word says they're having an argument. And the, and the religious leaders are here arguing with the disciples about this boy, and his, probably they're calling it his sin. And the, and the disciples are frustrated because they've been trying to cast the demon out and have been able, unable to do that. And so there's this real battle going on. And Jesus, who is all excited because he just been with Moses and Elijah. His father said, everyone be quiet. And Jesus comes down into this argument and says, oh, this unbelieving generation, how much longer must I put up with you? And I just want you to know that when Jesus is saying that, he's not talking about that dad, is he? He's talking about this horrible commotion that's going on all around this father who's in pain. This father who's desperately loves his son and is praying that Jesus will do it. But folks, circumstances influence our belief, don't they? Scott was a 12-year-old leader of his school. Had a newspaper route back in a day when you delivered newspapers on your bicycle. Loved by all of his friends. I mean, this was just one energetic young kid. And on, a, on I believe it was a Sunday or Monday morning, he rides his bike down across a street called Sierra Madre. And as he comes out on that street with his papers, there's a car coming and he pulls right in front of that car and is struck. By the end of the week, he will be declared dead at Children's Hospital in Los Angeles. 
circumstances. Circumstances suddenly change our thoughts, our feelings, and our beliefs. This week, Peyton, who attends our youth group, she and her family were at SeaWorld celebrating Stephen's birthday, the day before his birthday. Grandparents were there. They had a wonderful time together, celebrating time. They're driving back up on the freeway and get struck from behind by an 18-year-old driver driving way too fast. Stephen dies at the scene. Last I heard, mom's still in the hospital, still not quite clear. She'll hear that Stephen's died and, and then ask in an hour later, how are the kids? So there's confusion there. Circumstances, friends, circumstances can influence our beliefs, can't they? Kat was abused by her father as a two-year-old. When I say abused, I'm sorry, but I'm talking about sexual abuse as a two-year-old little girl. The abuse went on for years. How can Kat have a positive attitude about God as father in light of the father figure that she had? Circumstances can influence our beliefs. Angry dads, emotionally wounded mothers, neighbors who sexually harm a minor, a son who does not speak and often has fits that nearly kill him. Circumstances can influence our belief. What has happened in your life that influences your belief? Or, make it, or may even make it hard for you to believe? As I was preparing this message, I couldn't help but thinking that sometimes the diagnosis of a doctor can influence our belief. Think about that. We almost, we almost treat doctor's diagnosis as more powerful, more significant than even God's word. You hear the word like cancer. And now you accept that as that's the curse, that's the fact. Uh, a diagnosis of another can influence your belief. Autism is one of those examples. And I was reading 10 things that a child needs his parents to know about autism. And one of those key things was, is please don't, don't limit me by that label. Please realize that this is just a dynamic that I face, but I'm still special. I still can be creative. I still can accomplish many things. So please don't restrict me by that title. Diagnosis can actually influence our belief. So what happens when you hear a diagnosis? Cancer, heart disease, autism, Down syndrome, or inoperable. What's that do to your faith? Well, medicine has no answer for you. We don't know what to do for you. Modern medicine is pretty miraculous. But doesn't it also cause us to doubt God at times? So Jesus starts conversing with the man. So what's, the, what's, what's going on? What is happening here with you people? And this man comes up and he's my son. He starts telling his story. And Jesus makes this incredible statement. <laughs> Everything is possible for one who believes. Everything is possible for one who believes. But he says that after the man who's actually said, if you can, if you can do anything at all for my son, please have mercy on him. If you can. And Jesus responds, what? If I can? God, if you can, please help. The disciples wanted to help, but they couldn't do it. Jesus later will explain to them, and, and please note again, 
Jesus doesn't get mean to the disciples in this moment. He doesn't turn and say, what's wrong with you guys? Again, he's not the one saying to the disciples, you unbelieving generation of disciples, don't you get it? You have power and authority to cast out demons. How much longer do I have to spend with you? That's not who he's talking to. He's talking to those who are in outright denial and rejection of who he is. So later the disciples will have their conversation with him and they will ask him, Jesus, I'm sorry, Jesus, but it was really frustrating. Why couldn't we cast out the demon? And Jesus will simply respond. Sometimes they take extra prayer. And many of the texts will also say, and fasting. Some forces of darkness take more work than you might be able to address with just a simple spiritual snack. <clears throat> Do you ever wonder if God can? If you can, Jesus, please help my son. Do you ever wonder if God can? Can he heal the loved one? Can he help supply the financial needs? Can he raise the dead? I think our bigger challenge is not, God, can you? Our bigger challenge is, God, why don't you? Because pretty much, don't we believe that God can do the miraculous? If he raised himself from the dead, can't he do the supernatural beyond what we can think or imagine? It, I mean, he actually said to these same disciples, you're going to do greater things than I have done. You're going to cast out demons. You're going to heal the sick. You're even going to raise the dead. You're going to be able to pick up poisonous snakes and not die. He wasn't trying to tell us to start worshiping those poisonous snakes or to start worship services around them, but that's another story as well today. Just take, But he's saying... You're going to be able to do supernatural, incredible things. Do you all believe that? Because you're those disciples he's talking to also. That you have supernatural resources at your hand to use if you believe in Jesus Christ. Our question is not, if you can, God, because we believe he can. Our challenge is when he doesn't. Why not? Why not, God? It's the challenge Job was dealing with. <laughs> His friends had a lot of answers. It's all about you, Job. You've, probably, you've definitely screwed up, sin, been bad. And if you'll just finally confess your sin, then you'll be healed. Mm -mm. Why doesn't God give a miracle every time we ask? Why did Stephen die hours before his birthday that the family was celebrating. Why will this family have to suffer this loss for the rest of their living days? Why? At one point in the movie when Clavius is asking Peter several questions, Peter responds to him in frustration. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. We are followers. We follow to find out. <laughs> That's your study question for the day. What does that mean? We are followers. We follow to find out. <laughs> we are followers. We follow to find out. God, if you can, please help. God can, and oftentimes his help may be different than what we expect. And we don't at least know why. And frankly, what I have found in the many times from the, from the day that my nephew died at eight years old, ready, re his heart was all repaired, and all he needed to do was have his chest heal, and it wouldn't heal. After eight and a half years of heart surgeries, and Cody died. Why? Scott, who I mentioned earlier, Stephen this week. Why? And all, one of the things I've found is that there is no answer to that question, why, that will make me feel good. 
God could explain it in detail and it still wouldn't make me feel good. Because my why is I'm hurting God I don't understand. So the one thing I know that when somebody's in that deep kind of a pain that God is loving enough and big enough to accept it when we raise our fist at him, we <laughs> holler out at him, we get angry at him, we walk away from him, we want to reject him, and he's able to say, I still love you, and I'm still here for you. Because the great I am says, I am with you. And that's what we need. The promise of his presence, because frankly, no answer to that why is a good enough reason. Incidentally, just in a quick aside, please don't tell somebody when somebody they love died, especially a child, God needed them. Oh, this is the God of the universe who controls history and time, has all the resources of of heaven at his disposal and he needs a little child more than mom or dad or brother or sister or friends do? Please just don't use that phrase. If you have to say anything when you're talking to somebody who's hurting deeply like that and crying out why, speak with your arms and your eyes. And if you must put words to what you want to say, then simply say, I care. And I know God does too. What does the man say back to him? Jesus, I believe. But help my unbelief. I believe. But help me to overcome my unbelief. It's the word there for, for help is a word that's called boethos. Boethos includes running and crying. Run and cry with me, Jesus. Help my unbelief. Come to my side. 2 Corinthians 6 2 says, For he says, In the time of my favor, I heard you. In the, in the days of salvation, I helped you. I ran and I cried with you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. Hebrews 2 18, Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to run and cry with those who are being tempted. He is able to help them. Hebrews 13 6. So we say, with confidence. The Lord is my helper. The Lord runs and cries with me. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? Oh God, I have problems at times believing. Help me to overcome my unbelief. <laughs> Folks, there's a difference between doubt and defiance. Welcome back, kids. <laughs> when they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. Jesus is tired of the arguing of the, of the religious leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He's tired of them arguing with who he is. He's tired of them complaining. He's tired of them rejecting him. This is not about doubt. This is about blatant defiance of him as God. You unbelieving generation, you've made a choice not to follow. You've made a choice not to believe. So I'm tired of you. But to the man who wants his son to be healed. Everything, everything is possible to one who believes. I believe, Jesus, help my unbelief. And what will Jesus do? More commotion starts to come. People are starting to come up. There's more arguers, quick, demon, come out, be silent, go away, leave and don't ever come back. 
Now, oh no, he's dead. See, he just killed him. All those complainers, those defiant non-believers. Look, Jesus just killed the young. He's not dead. Young man, stand up. Show them. And the man will stand. And the man will walk away with his son. We believe, friends, don't we? But don't we doubt too? If you're honest with yourself and God, aren't there moments you wonder, did Jesus really rise from the dead or is this just another story? How many times do you hear things on the History Channel and other places like that that try to undermine our faith and our belief in Jesus Christ? Thomas said, I need to see and I need to touch. Now Thomas, John 20, now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the 12, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We've seen the Lord. You guys are crazy. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. That's not defiance. That's questioning. That's doubt. That's trying to say, I need to touch myself. No, Judas defies. He's going to take control for 30 pieces of silver. He'll make his choice. Peter doubts. He's standing there on the water. Yes, folks. He's standing there on the water. He's walking towards Jesus. He realizes that there's a storm blowing all around him and the waves are splashing him. And suddenly he looks down and he comes to his senses and realizes people don't walk on the water. And what does Jesus say to him? As Peter said, Master, rescue me! And he grabs a hold of him and says, Why did you what? Why did you doubt? <sighs> what kind of guy was this Peter? He's out there on the water already. I mean, what's he got to doubt? He's experiencing that nobody else on that boat experienced. No one else got out of there. No one else was getting the privilege. Why not? Because they were afraid. There's a difference. There's a huge difference between doubt and defiance. Pilate washes his hands of Jesus. Festus, King Festus and King Agrippa, they said, well, that's an interesting story, Paul. Come back and tell us more another day. There's a difference between doubt and defiance. Don't we all have doubts? When it comes to God stuff in the family, it's easy to admit areas where you are struggling, doubting. Or do you sometimes feel like you have to pretend that you're okay? I meant to say, is it easy? Is it easy to say, to admit, or do you, do you have to pretend that you're okay? Do you sometimes feel like you're pretending even here at church, at worship? Let me just give you this quick illustration. In the Guinness Book of World Records, you'll find the most successful lawyer in history was a man named Sir Lionel Laku. He won 245 successive murder acquittals as a defense attorney. He was knighted twice by Queen Elizabeth, and he was appointed Queen's Counsel to conduct court work on behalf of the Crown. Wouldn't it be cool if we could have the legal opinion of a towering intellect like Sir Lucku to help us answer some of the greatest riddles? Well, guess what? One day, someone did exactly that and went to Sir Lucku and said, they challenged him to take his legal skills and apply them to the evidence of the resurrection. He spent several years studying the historical record. He finally summarized his conclusion with this, quote, I say unequivocally, this is an attorney, guys, who, by the way, was not a Christian. I say unequivocally that the evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is so powerful that it compels acceptance by proof which leaves, leaves absolutely no room for doubt. Sir Lucku became a Christian at age 64 as a result of his research. Matthew 28 says, the disciples come to see Jesus. It's at the last day he's about to ascend to heaven. It's what this movie is a lot about. 
and says that the, the disciples came. And verse 17 says, when they saw him, they worshipped him. Wouldn't you? If Jesus came walking into the room right now, literally just stood up here and you could actually touch him like the disciples touch him, not just put your hand through a ghost, it's not an image, it's a real thing. Okay. If you actually could touch Jesus, wouldn't you like worship and celebrate? But don't miss the rest of the verse. And some doubted. And some doubted. These are the guys who ate with him. These guys who well, did miracles with him. These guys experienced all this stuff. And yet some still doubted. John 20, verse 27, following. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop disbelieving. Stop doubting. And believe, Thomas. And Thomas said to him, my Lord. My Lord and my God. Incidentally, that is the first time Jesus is referred to with that kind of declaration. It's an incredible supernatural moment for Thomas. My Lord and my God. You are God, Jesus. He's getting it. By the way, this is before the Holy Spirit comes. He's getting it. This is not just an incredible man risen from the dead. This is God standing right in front of him. And he's down on the ground. And he's like, oh no, God, my Lord and my God. And then Pete, Jesus says to him, Thomas, because you've seen me, you have believed. That's wonderful. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. Folks, will you admit your doubts? And because if you don't, then you won't get to the second piece of the, what the father prayed. I believe, but help my unbelief. Will you admit your doubt so that you can come to that place of saying, help my unbelief? Will you confess? God, I believe, but there's times I wonder. God, I want the resurrection to be true. But sometimes I get afraid of dying. God, I want you to supply my needs according to your riches. But sometimes I doubt that you will. Will you admit your unbelief? Because if you will, you're going to open up the door for what happened for Thomas <laughs> to see incredible things. It's really about honesty with God, isn't it? Let's pray. Jesus. If we haven't had one of those crisis moments, the, it's probably still coming down the road. There's those moments that we just have no answer for. Like Stephen dying on Monday. Or the pain that that his mom and his sister, his stepdad, his father, the grandparents, all that they're feeling. We have no answer. We can't explain. We have this sense that you do care though, that you are there, and, but we don't understand. And there's times that the circumstances we face cause us severe doubts, questions. God, I thank you that it's when we're honest about our questions that you respond with kindness and love. But when we defy you, when we argue with you, and not like the, the, the arguing of a parent that's grieving, but, but when we just argue in our intellectualism or our super spiritualism, we fail. God, we doubt. But you are faithful. Help our unbelief. Before I conclude this prayer, with everybody head bowed, you could be one of those people that's doubted whether Jesus really is Son of God. You're here today even, and you, you, you've had these twinges inside that there's something more to this. But you've never said yes. And today is the day that God's inviting you to say, come, help my unbelief. One of the things I know that the honest searcher, the honest seeker, God will show himself 
and help them to believe. Do you want to believe in Jesus? I invite you, just raise your hand and say it as a statement to him, I want to believe in you, Jesus. Yes. He sees that hand. Anyone else? Yes, he sees that hand. Before you leave here today, tell somebody that you know, I'm asking Jesus to help me to believe. God, we admit that we doubt. And we thank you that you don't reject us. Help our unbelief. In the name of Jesus, amen. Please stand.